We are back on the Rational Boomer podcast. Hopefully your day is going well. It is Thursday. We got a hell of a week going on. I just want to preface this by saying uh, I'm kind of feeling like I'm getting a little bit of a cold. You know how you feel it in the back of your throat? Uh, I'm used to working while I'm sick. Back in the days when I was a traffic reporter, I'd get up at four in the morning, be on the air at six, go till nine, and then come back at 3.30 and work till seven. And I frequently had to work while I was sick. And that was because the job I was doing for the station I was working at, I was really the only one that could do the job. So I had no choice. I had to come in and I toughed my way through every sickness and all of that sort of thing until one day when I'm on the air, I'm sick and I'm talking. And then all of a sudden I completely lost my voice. Now that's a problem when you're on the radio. At that point, they just sent me home. Um, I don't like being sick. Uh, my granddaughter had a little bit of a cold and, and we all know little kids and daycares and such, they're like Petri discs full of bacteria. And so if hanging out with my granddaughter gets me sick, I'm cool with it. I have no problem. You know, you know, it's funny. It reminds me when I was a little kid, I've told you about my dad, how big a narcissist and how he only really cared about himself. When I was a little kid, I used to get sick a lot. I get a lot of colds. I had my adenoids out twice. I had my um, my tonsils out. I had all kinds of difficulties uh, with having colds. So it was like a constant thing. And whenever my father got a cold, it was detrimental to him because he was a salesman. He had to put his best face forward and getting the cold pissed him off, as is the case with narcissists. What really struck me, and I didn't know at the time that it was any big deal or how ridiculous and how horrible it was, but if he'd get a cold and I had a cold or one of the other siblings had a cold, he'd literally blame us and he'd go, he'd yell at us. You gave me the cold, God damn it, I can't believe I got to work, I make the money, you know, all that kind of shit. And I never understood that. I mean, you can get a cold from fucking virtually anywhere. Uh, but to blame little kids that you got a cold, I'm not being worried about the kid having a cold. I'm more worried about my granddaughter having a cold than I am. I'm 63 years old. I've lived through a bunch of colds. I'll be fine. Uh, anyway, I tell you that only because um, as I'm doing the podcast, uh, there were maybe occasions where I have to cough. I don't have a cough switch here, and it's not like radio where I can hit the cough switch, turn away, cough, and you don't know anything about it. This is video. It's basically live to video here. What I'm doing is what you're seeing. There is no editing. There's nothing like that. So when I'm doing this podcast or any other podcast in the future, maybe from time to time, I'm going to have to cough. And all I can really do is turn away, maybe get off mic a little bit and cough. I'm going to do it. So you're going to have to deal with it. And I'm sure you will. I've done it in the past on the show. I just want to give you a heads up that it might be more frequent now that I have this potentially current condition of a common cold. Well, we had a hell of a day yesterday, a lot of uh, fallout from the night before the elections where the Republicans got their ass kicked, you know, for years, well, not years, since the um, Republicans overturned Roe v. Wade, I've always said that was their worst mistake. That is their biggest problem. And of course, in 2022, they had overturned Roe v. Wade. They thought there was a red wave coming in the midterms, and they got their ass kicked. Now, you would have thought that at that point they would say, oh, geez, that's a bad idea. That's a loser. Maybe we'll try something different. But they didn't. They embraced it and they fucking doubled down. It's pretty amazing. The ignorance of it all or the arrogance. I don't know if it's one or the other or both or what, but they just embraced it. So last time, this last election, a couple of nights ago, where Ohio came out and voted to make abortion legal to uh, um, and, and in Virginia, where the Democrats took control of the House and the Senate, based on uh, Governor Yunkin's claim that he was going to ban abortions after 15 weeks. The people of the respective areas spoke out. Uh, 
And it's not surprising, not to you and I, but apparently it is to Republicans, because we know 70 percent of this country support Roe v. Wade. And once you realize that, why would you take that up as a cause if you know you're going to lose anyway? Well, it's interesting uh, because in spite of what happened the other night when the Republicans got their ass kicked once again, they're still doubling down. They're still embracing it. And this one issue is going to be the one that takes down the Republicans in 2024. I'll guarantee you that, especially since they're not giving up on it. It's funny, Lindsey Graham came out after going through 2022, after going through the elections a couple of nights ago. And what's he say? He says, well, here's the deal. We are going to bring to Congress a national abortion ban. What? Why would you do that? You know, the vast majority of the country is against it. So you decide to announce, take ownership of this cause when you've got elections coming up in 2024, a year away. And I'm trying to imagine why you would do that. That is the dumbest thing ever. And what I came up with is this. The Republicans know they're losing a grip. They're losing ground. They're losing generally. And it makes them angry. They think they're right. So it seems as though the Republicans want to um, ignore what the vast majority of people want to do and then take their ideas, regardless of if they're popular or not, and shove them down our throat. They think that's going to work. Well, clearly it hasn't worked in 2022 and the other night. And I honestly believe if nothing else was happening with the Republicans, just that one issue, the abortion issue, that will be the one that causes them to lose in 2024. And what happened in Virginia and Ohio and some other places, you would think that would light a bulb above their head and they would realize that. And maybe it has, and maybe they don't care. I heard uh, a couple of other people talking from the Republican Party, and they were incensed by the fact that Ohio voted to make abortion legal. One was Rick Santorum, and uh, uh, one was Governor Kasich, the former governor of Ohio. And they seemed uh, angry uh, that that Ohio allowed this to be on a ballot. And, and trust me, Ohio did everything they could to keep it off the ballot. They played every fucking card they could have come up with. They didn't want it on the ballot because they knew they knew what the people would do. So Governor Kasich and, and Santorum were talking about this. Um, and Santorum said this, and I swear Kasich said this too. They said, um, pure democracy doesn't work. We shouldn't be doing that. Now, what they meant by that was uh, this vote on abortion in Ohio was pure democracy. It wasn't representative democracy. Everybody in Ohio had a chance to vote whether they were for or against abortion. The people spoke, and it turns out they support abortion. Now, what Kasich and Santorum were suggesting, we shouldn't even allow that. We need the representative uh, democracy, meaning we've got dumb fuck politicians going to Washington and then voting for us, supposedly doing our bidding. But what they suggested in this situation, because they were against what the vast majority of people voted for, was, no, we're not going to do what you want. We're going to make you take what we think you need. And that's just not what the deal is. That's not in your job description, but that's how they want it. They don't like the fact that the people spoke and they got what they wanted. Instead, they want control over that. And to me, that's a red flag. We need to worry about that, whether it be Republicans or Democrats that have that feeling. When this country was formed, it was intended for us, the people, to have the power. And over time, our government and the people in the government have taken that away from us. We know better for you. Well, I tell you what, I disagree. Frankly, I wouldn't be opposed to voting for everything. Let's put gun control on the ballot. Let's put abortion on the ballot. Let's put health care on the ballot. Let's put all these things on the ballot. And instead of you telling us what you think should be done, let's hear what the people of this country truly want. 
and then let's give it to the motherfuckers. Okay. All right. I got a ton of emails, a ton of emails, and I love the emails. And the uh, impression I get is all of you like the emails too. I think it's important we hear from listeners. So let's do that. All right. This one starts out. Dear Boomer, I am a Brit who watches you regularly, and you may be wondering why a Brit is so interested in American politics, and I feel that's important for people to understand. So here goes. In 2015, when Trump first run, I couldn't believe it. I have never been very interested in politics, but even I in little old UK had heard the reputation of Trump as being underhanded, morally corrupt, mob-minded, etc. So I did a basic Google search to find out, find out and was surprised to find page after page painting him as a wonderful guy. And I know that isn't the fact. Having no idea about search engines, I asked my tech-savvy daughter. She said, yes, there are ways to promote your article to the top of the Google list. It costs you, but you can do it. Now I'm interested. Would Trump and his backers pay for that much propaganda to flood the searches to uh, to uh, for dirt on Trump? Having a basic idea of Trump's background and big money conservative donors, I thought you're damn right they would. But anyway, that's what got me interested. And when he actually got elected, I couldn't believe it. Now, my idea of an average American went from the basic Brit ideas that you're loud, boastful, and on the crass side. Oh, don't know where you got that from. <laughs> Excuse me that I'm a Brit and become one of very gullible idiots. How could so many people fall for that bullshit? Then, of course, we voted uh, for Boris Johnson. And I began to wonder. I mean, there was a lot of there when Boris Johnson was first in, a lot of people made a comparisons to Donnie Trump. And uh, I think you know what happened there. She goes on to say, I began with watching national news stations because I assumed your news was like ours. Boy, was I wrong. Then I found the independent Internet channels, the Young Turks, Brian Tyler Cohen, Glenn Kirshner, Midas Touch, The Damage Report, David Pakman, etc. And they seemed to have more of the truth, which I did test with research before I watched regularly. And that's a good idea. But it was watching the individual like you, Texas Paul, Blue Dot in Texas, etc., that made me think my stereotypical of Im image of America was completely wrong. Now, I've been told by Trump Lefux, uh, that my opinion is irrelevant because I'm not an American. But you have to understand the close connection with all America. Britain has always had to know we follow America into all their wars. We were there in Korea and Vietnam. And we were there in Afghanistan and Iraq. I don't think the average Trump Lefuck has that much knowledge. And the thought of that morally corrupt moron having his greasy ketchup stained fingers anywhere near nuclear options, especially as a lot of them are positioned in the UK and Europe, gave me cold sweats. And then there is his obsession with dictators. Imagine him getting in again, him rolling out Project 2025 and turning America into an oligarch oligarchy with him in a lifetime position. It turned my blood cold. He would ally with Russia, and that would mean with two of the top nuclear powers allied, they could annex anyone they wanted. They were both that power hungry and insane, so obviously I would rather they didn't. Now, that's my nightmare and explanation why I looked for any light in the dark, and I found it in people like you, normal thinking, sensible people uh, who tells it like it is. You're a light in the dark. You bring sanity where anxiety and fear could cloud thought. So I thank you for that. P.S. Sorry it's so long. Angela the Brit. Angela, thank you. And um, I don't think what you think is irrelevant. I mean... <laughs> Granted, Donald Trump or Biden are president of the United States of America, but a U.S. president does play a big role on an international level. And of course, uh, the U.K. is an ally of ours. We've leaned on them a lot over the years. I mean, ever since we uh, fought them and got away from them. But ever since that time, uh, we have been allies and, and they are an important ally. I think... 
you know, it's one thing for me to look at North, well, not even North Korea, another country and not really having an opinion about the leader. But with the United States, it's a different situation. Because not only what a president does affects all of us here, but it affects the world at large. So I understand your concerns and your fears. But I will tell you this, Angela, I think we're at the point uh, where we're getting out of the darkness and finally headed the right direction. And I know I thank you for putting me in the category of some of the people you named. Those are people I have respect for, too. I don't always agree with them, but... I have respect that they're doing the best they can to tell the truth. So, Angela, thank you very much. I appreciate it immensely. And write again. Don't don't wait. Just keep writing. We love to hear insights from all people on the Rational Boomer podcast. Next up is an email from Todd. Why isn't anyone talking about the court of public opinion that Trump is trying to win? This has always happened over the years. Scott Peterson lost in the court of public opinion. Trump and Fox News and any other outlet is doing their best to allow all of Trump's protesting and arguments to win the court of public opinion with anyone and everyone on the side of the coin. I really enjoy your perspective, and I'm very happy to hear that you read quite a few emails from the average person who listens to you, Todd. Well, Todd... You may very well be an average person, but I can tell you this, short of me being on TikTok and doing this podcast, I'm an average person too. There's nothing special about what I do. I have the same opinions as a lot of people. The only difference between me and say you and some other people is I'm loud about it. I don't hesitate to talk about it. And I'm not afraid of any kind of retribution because I don't have a boss and I don't have people telling me you shouldn't do that or you can't do that. Even if they did, I would do it anyway. So hopefully I can be kind of a a, a surrogate for all the reasonable people that listen to the Rational Boomer podcast, and I can bring it out loud and proud and make our points. Um, the court of public opinion, that's a weird thing these days. The court of public opinion is something Donald Trump has played on and continues to play on. The problem is, is the public opinion levels are really working against Donald Trump. Of course, the base love him and will tolerate anything from him. But 75% of this country think he's a dipshit, a criminal, that he's corrupt, that he's an insurrectionist, he's a treasonist. So if he's trying to play the court of public opinion, there may have been a time where that worked for him. It's not working anymore. And the court of public opinion is a good thing to use. But ultimately, we have to count on the uh, Department of Justice and our governments and our <clears throat> law enforcement. And we need to have them pick it up a notch because they're failing a little bit. I mean, I think the DOJ is doing a decent job, but I think everybody is upset and disappointed by how long it's taking. I understand we have to wait a certain amount of time. There is a procedure to all this stuff, but I'm as anxious as the next guy. But I do feel confident that ultimately all the people that committed the misdeeds from the moment Donald Trump stepped in office till after the January 6th insurrection, all the way up to the uh, people um, claiming the big lie. These people will all be held accountable. They will get theirs. There was a time when Donald Trump was president where we thought it all could be covered up. But now all the evidence is open to the light of day. We all know what the fuck is up. There has to be accountability or there will be problems in this country. All right, Jeff, he writes, why are you so confident that Trump will lose when the polls show the scum ahead. I've talked about this before, but I'll talk about it again. I think it's uh, important. Um, the polls are saying, I'll tell you a couple of reasons why I know he'll lose. The polls, for example, the polls that suggest Donald Trump would win in five swing states against Joe Biden. That's well and good. A couple of things we don't know. Who's financing these polls? What are the questions they're asking? Who are they talking to? We don't know any of that. And we know the Republicans are 
not beneath playing fucking games with the narrative. Here's the other thing. The polls in 2011 said Barack Obama would lose. The polls in 2016 said Hillary Clinton would win. The polls in 2020 said that Donald Trump would win. The polls in 2022 said there would be a red wave. Guess what? Every one of those motherfuckers was wrong. The other thing to consider is we're a year out from the election. Any kind of information you get now has to be uh, taken with a grain of salt. But let's talk about that poll that you're so worried about. I was watching, and I think I talked about this yesterday, but I was watching Rachel Maddow. And she's one of the few moderators that I think understands the circumstances and isn't afraid to speak the truth. Um, that same poll that said Donald Trump would beat Joe Biden in swing states by 4%. There was another question in that poll that all the media wasn't reporting. That other question was this, what would you do if Donald Trump was convicted of a felony? And you know what the story was there? All those people that said they would vote for Donald Trump over Joe Biden would then flip and vote for Biden to the tune of about 13 percent, 14 percent. 14 percent would then vote for Joe Biden if he he Donald Trump was convicted of a felony. Well, we know he's got 91 felony charges. We know the um, the prosecutors have a conviction rate of 99 percent. Do you really think that Donald Trump is going to run the table? No, he's not. And the <clears throat> and the uh, trial in Washington, D.C. Uh, with Judge Chutkin and Jack Smith, that's starting in March. And it doesn't look like Judge Chutkin is willing to delay this thing. She's ramped things up. She is collecting uh, jurors in the first part of February. So this is going to happen. Now, this trial could last three or four months, maybe, maybe maximum. So that puts us into the summer of 2024. And I'll guarantee you in that case, Donald Trump will be convicted. So those polls that suggest Donald Trump would win in swing states is out the fucking window based on what else the poll said that nobody bothered to tell us. Bottom line is what I've said before, don't trust polls. Whether they're good polls or bad polls, they're notoriously wrong, and it's not worth paying attention to them. If you were to listen to those polls the other day about how everybody's so strongly Republican and so strongly mega, how did Ohio happen? How did Virginia happen? How did this all happen if everybody's so pro-Republican? Fact is, the Republicans have done themselves in. And as I've said, for many reasons, but mainly the abortion issue. That's enough right there without anything else to take them down in 2024. Add all the other stuff. It's like frosting on the cake. They're fucking done. They're over. Donald Trump is done. I can tell you this. I hope he is the candidate. I don't think he'll be the candidate. I don't think he can be the nominee based on all the shit he's going to be going through. But I kind of hope he is because Donald Trump will get an absolute ass whooping. As I've said before, Donald Trump in 2020 lost by 7 million votes. Since that time in 2020 to this date today, what has he done to improve his situation, improve his support, improve getting votes? Nothing. He's done the opposite. He's lost support. He's lot lost uh, votes. Everybody endorses, loses. So that's how I can guarantee you Donald Trump will lose in 2024, if in fact he even runs. All right. Next one up. Hello, Mike. Over the road, Russell here. Coming to you from the road today, it's Chicago, Illinois. Just wanted to check in and ask you your thoughts on a couple of politicians who may be important in the future. Uh, number one, Andy Bashir. He was up for re-election as the Kentucky governor, and he beat the Trump-endorsed Republican, I'll remind you, who was the AG of Kentucky. Andy Bashir is a sharp guy, and for him to be able to win the Kentucky governorship in a red state being a Democrat, that's quite impressive. 
He's not as uh, high profile as some governors, like the next governor you're going to suggest. Um, but I think he's got a bright future in uh, the Democratic Party. Gavin Newsom from California, the governor. I would say right now, if you were to pick somebody other than Biden to be the best prospect to be the Democratic uh, candidate for president, Gavin Newsom would be there. He's not old, but he's not incredibly young. He's very articulate. He's a good looking guy. Um, he isn't afraid to get in people's faces. He would be a great prospect for president, but he's smart enough to know that, you know, don't fuck with things right now. Wait your wait your time. So I think you'll see Gavin Newsom if he can maintain his status uh, being a possible candidate in 2028. Hakeem Jeffries, House Minority Leader. What other prominent politi politicians should we be paying attention to? Keep up your important work. Thanks. Over the road, Russell. Hakeem Jeffries, I think, is a hot prospect. Come 2024, he will be the Speaker of the House, and he'll be a very powerful Speaker of the House. Uh, he'll get a lot of things done. And I think he could definitely be a presidential candidate in 2028, and I think he would be an excellent president. He has some similarities to Biden, some similarities to uh, um, Obama. But the difference with him is the same what I was talking about with Gavin Newsom. He's not afraid to get in people's faces and be tough. And I think that's the, the direction we have to go with the Republican Party. They've got to be tougher. They've got to be willing to fight. And Hakeem Jeffries, that motherfucker is a fighter. I like him. I think if I was to pick between the three to be president in uh, 2028, it would be Hakeem. But again, that's a long way away. We don't know what's going to happen in the next four years. All right, the next one, Alaskan Mike. Good morning, Mike. I appreciate all you do, and thank you. I heard Dan the other day, and appreciate him as well. Let Dan know if he's getting criticism from his first visit. Fuck them, motherfuckers. I second that emotion. It takes courage and guts to come out with you in the audience, especially knowing how many listen to your podcast, YouTube. Dan, you did just fine. Look forward to hearing from you again and soon. Alaskan Mike. I agree. I agree. I have yet uh, I have yet to have anybody on this show, any listener on the show that I regret it. Well, some of the Trump fucks, I might have regretted having them on, but it was kind of fun kicking their ass. So that was a uh, what is that? A guilty pleasure of mine, I guess. I don't know that it held much value in terms of information, but it was fun as a motherfucker. Everybody else, though. You know, everybody we have on the show is different. I mean, we had Maddie on yesterday, a uh, transgender woman, very bright, very articulate, has some great insights. It doesn't matter what your life or lifestyle is or what your uh, uh, limitations are, or if you're the smartest person, it doesn't matter here. I want to hear from everybody. And some people will do it differently, and that's fine. I don't care. The only thing I'm intolerant of is Trumplifux. Everything else, you're more than welcome. I think that's the important part of the Rational Boomer podcast. Everybody gets to talk if they want to. And I mean that, anybody. People always say, uh, uh, could I get an invite? Just send me an email. Tell me you want to be on. And within a couple of days, assuming the timing works, on, works out, you'll be fucking on. So we're always welcoming. And thank you for that Alaskan Mike. All right, the next email. Mike, I'm writing to talk about how the morbidly rich people of this country have worked very hard to kill the middle class and why they do this. During the FDR years, our government began for the first time to spend tax dollars to help people of the working class. It worked better than expected. There was rapid growth in the middle of the people uh, uh, in the middle class standard of living. Home ownership rose by 40% in 1945 to 60% in 1960, and the middle class was larger than ever before. During the 1950s, the Republicans and a few very rich men began complaining and predicting that having a large middle class will result in an unstable country. Based on what? In the 1960s, laws were put in place to control the bad people who were protesting the war and fighting for civil rights. 
The policies of the war on drugs were introduced and put strict laws and punishment in place for those who broke the laws, mostly black people and to a lesser extent, white students. All, of course, who smoke pot. We became the country with more people in prison than any other country in the world. During the 1960s and 70s, women were now using birth control and were able to start careers. And they fought for equal rights and pay in the workplace. This was getting out of hand for the conservatives. And instead of working to solve these problems, they fought back. In 1971, several very rich community leaders began to organize to reverse the trend of people questioning policies of their government. One such person was Lewis Powell, who would later become a member of the Supreme Court. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president after negotiating with Iran to delay releasing the hostages until after he won the election. He said in his inaugural speech that the government, meaning democracy and freedom, is not the solution, but rather it was the problem. He fought against labor unions and lowered the tax rate for the very rich in corporations from 87% to 28%. He did this saying that the trickle-down economy policy will eliminate the national debt. He ended up tripling the national debt. All of this began the movement that got us to Trump and his drive to be an authoritarian fascist dictator. Today, 60% of the people in this country are living paycheck to paycheck and do not have any savings to pay for an emergency that might come up. We need a better life for the citizens of this country who are not rich, Mike. Mike, I've noticed how you do a very good job boiling down many facts to make it easier for people to see the bigger picture and understand what is going on in our country. I briefly provided a number of facts in hopes that you will fact check this information and give more background information for people to use when they vote and advocate for the future. Thank you for providing me this opportunity. Max. Well, thank you, Max. And, and I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that um, I don't have to fact check it. I know for a fact what you said is true. It's very insidious what the wealthy and the corporations want to do. And I always find it strange that they want to pound on the middle class. The middle class is the backbone of this country. They pay a lot of taxes. And the rich grift the middle class constantly, the rich and the government. And it always struck me as strange. Why would you kill the golden goose? Meaning if you get rid of the middle class or you diminish the middle class, who are you going to grift now? And then when you have nobody you can grift, then you're going to go down the shitter. I've always made the comparison of a dog with dog food. You put some in a dish, he eats it. You put some more, he eats it. You put some more, he eats it. He's greedy for the food and he keeps eating it. That's what the rich are doing. But eventually the dog explodes or eventually the rich destroy the middle class. And then where are they going to steal their money from? It's strange. It's, it's, it's the essence of greed. It absolutely is the very essence of greed. And I think that um, they're very so short-sighted about this. I mean, everybody talks about you know, we should run this country by a business, like a business. So let's just say it's a business. Say tax dollars paid out by the government are investments. Say it's your investments. Now, if you've do, done any investing, there, you have a portfolio, and there are different things you invest money in. You have some things that are more risky or that don't have the best return, and other things that have great returns and are a safe bet. And that's the way you can look and our economy and the people in this country. Since the middle class is so important to the backbone of this country and the taxes collected in this country, you would think anybody who's a smart investor would want to allow the middle class to flourish. The more the middle class flourishes, the more money they make, the more taxes they pay, the more people working, it, it just means more money into the economy. Instead, what they want to do is hand the money over to the wealthy who don't pay taxes and don't give anything in return. Well, not to us anyway. There is some kickback 
from these wealthy people, but it goes directly in the pockets of our members of Congress. But that's unsustainable. Once you destroy the middle class, you've essentially destroyed this country. And how they don't see that, I don't quite fucking understand. It makes no sense. We need to get smarter people in government. We need people who are less greedy. We need people who are are not willing to uh, take money under the table. We need people who understand the job description, and that's working for the people of this country, doing the bidding of the people in this country. These people that don't like uh, pure democracy or or want to shove their preferences down our throat. That's got to stop. It's not sustainable. And taking money from us, giving it to the wealthy, or putting it in the the, the uh, defense fund is not sustainable. We're at a tipping point right now where people are having troubles just affording the basics of living. That means the middle class is on the edge. This needs to change for everybody involved, including the rich people, and you would hope they'd see that, but they don't. So, Max, thank you for your input. Uh, you, you, you do what a lot of people do for me here. You teach me some things or you bring up some things that get me to think, and I appreciate that. That's why I really enjoy doing the emails. Believe it or not, we still have more emails to go. We will take a quick break, and we will be right back. We are back on the Rational Boomer podcast, and uh, we're doing a lot of emails today. We're going to talk about some other stuff, too, but we've got some emails to deal with, and uh, I've made a commitment to read as many emails as I get, because your input, your perspective is just as important on this show as mine. All right, the next email says, hey, Mike, I'm really happy today. Now, I will tell you, this email came in before Ivanka Trump testified. Just keep that in mind. Hey, Mike, I'm really happy today. I got to tell you, Donnie Douche managed to make his daughter taking the stand tomorrow anticlimactic. In one fell swoop, he managed to show how intelligent he is by completely obliterating his entire defense. Everyone was so looking forward to seeing the impact of having Ivanka testify, and it doesn't matter anymore. The good judge, Angeron, played him like a fiddle, and now the only question is, how much? I'm interested in seeing whether Trump's counsel puts up a defense. After all, it would be totally pointless, and the best that could come from it uh, is they piss off the judge enough of him to revoke their licenses to practice in the state. I think that's coming anyway. Still, they're going to do as their Lord and Master sees fit, even if it means walking into the fire themselves. One other thing, I'm sure you've seen Shawshank Redemption. I have. If you haven't, do so immediately. It's one of the best movies ever made. Anyway, my point is our good friend Mike Johnson so very much reminds me of The Warden. Is it just me, or do you see the similarities as well? God bless Paul. Hadn't thought about it, but I kind of do. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, Ivanka Trump being her testifying is on anticlimactic. It, it ended up being that way in the sense uh, that it went from being a circus to a little more sedate. But Ivanka uh, came through. She was very forgetful, like his like her family and her brothers and her dad. But she took it a step farther that basically threw Donald Trump under the bus and put the final nail in the coffin for Donald Trump. She would say things, well, I don't remember that, but I don't quibble about this document. I'm not saying the document's not real or that it didn't happen. I, I just don't remember. It's kind of like a humble brag there. I'm going to throw my dad under the bus, but I'm going to put it in soft terms. That's pretty much what she did. And uh, with Ivanka Trump testifying, it didn't go well for Donald Trump. I'm not even sure what he's going to do with that. I'm looking forward to later today hearing his response. Is he going to call out his daughter? Is he not going to say anything? Is he going to cry and whine? Probably all three. All right. The next email says, hi, Mike. 
Donnie on the stand was ridiculous. Personally, I was surprised he didn't get charged with contempt of court. His testimony was a rambling mess. There were a couple of moments where his testimony might help Letitia James, Fonnie Willis, or Jack Smith. When asked who was responsible for making sure the documents were correct, Trump said everybody. That only helps Letitia James. There is also a document Trump signed in January of 2021 taking back control of the Trump Organization. That proves Trump knew at least on that date that he had lost and was going to be a private citizen. That's true. Jack Smith and Fonnie Willis will be happy to see that. Now, Eric and Don Jr.'s testimonies didn't help either. Either Hawk or Legal Dad was talking about how their admissions of basically signing everything and not knowing what they signed uh, pointed to intentional recklessness, which is also illegal. The penalty for intentional recklessness is to lose all profits gained from that behavior. If the judge agrees with that position, this could bring the penalties over a billion dollars. I don't see any way they get out of this with any properties left. Hawk also pointed out that with Trump and Sons basically admitting to committing fraud under oath, that it basically kills any chance of any appeals being successful. They have effectively talked themselves into the poorhouse. I think that they did that even before the uh, testimonies, but I get your point. One of my newer co-workers sometimes sounds rather intelligent, and then he says something that makes him sound as dumb as a trump -lefuck. Today we were talking about the backlash that Dwayne Johnson and Oprah were getting due to their asking people to donate for the Hawaiian relief efforts. People are pissed that these celebrities, who are both extremely wealthy, are asking non-wealthy people to donate. I mentioned the wealth gap, and he went on a rant about how even people, even the people in poverty here are better off than most of the rest of the world. He basically said there was no excuse for being poor, as you could always find a better paying job. I know a lot of people who think this way. They would rather put all the blame on the worker and not the blame on the businesses and the politician who always who allow these businesses to get away with not paying their employees fairly. Sure, anybody can get a job, but can they make them enough money to actually survive? That's the real question. There needs to be massive changes when it comes to wages in this country. We need to get back to where a 40-hour minimum wage job can actually support a family like it was intended. Unfortunately, too many people feel that minimum wage should be a living wage. I don't know where they lost sight of that, but I'm guessing Reagan is probably to blame. Eric. I don't disagree. And as I was talking about the middle class before, if the middle class isn't flourishing, this country's in trouble. And we should have enough foresight to be able to see that. We need more people making enough money to live so they can work 40 hours, spend time with their families. You would think... Um, the Republicans, who are all about families, right? You would think they'd want the people to spend more time with their families. Instead, they grift money and they abuse people in the middle class, so they have to work two and three jobs and can't spend time with their families. Don't talk to me about abortion if you're um, purposely taking people away from their families. Fuck you. This one comes from Jeff from Ohio. He says, hey, Mike, O-H, way to go, Ohio, Jeff from Ohio. I can't disagree with you, Jeff. I am so excited and so proud of what Ohio did. The people of Ohio, they sp spoke out and uh, knocked these Republican, uh, Republican uh, politicians for a loop, and they don't know what to do with themselves. They're losing their shit. Next one is, Boomer, a good night, read the elections. Here locally, Virginia affirmed, reaffirmed its shift towards blue and retained the House and Senate. This shuts down Yunkin. I think some of the big money guys are still eyeballing him for POTUS because he's mastered walking a middle line on Trump and looks so damn good in a fleece vest. Yeah, Yunkin lost a lot of stock after this happened. Not too many people were expecting this to happen, but damned if it didn't. And again, it goes back to what I've said before and why the uh, presidential election, as far as I'm concerned, is a foregone conclusion. 
It's all about abortion. I mean, you think about it, you take away the constitutional right and bodily autonomy from 50% of this country, that's not a winner in elections, not to mention that 70% of the people support Roe v. Wade. It's a bad hill to die on, but it seems like the Republicans are happy to do it. Now, this this emailer goes on to say he's been quiet as a governor, kind of waiting for this election to uncoil. But it's like Maddie was saying, I think she, uh, yeah, Maddie was saying, voters are just so much better informed now, at least the ones who want to be. We knew he was a snake in a vest, so he got shut down. And all of a sudden, he's not such a hot political prospect. He goes on to say, um, here, very locally, we rejected a MAGA candidate who, be, who came breezing in looking like Zorro or something. Strong candidate with looks and a cool name with money behind him. Soundly beaten by, honestly, an average candidate. MAGA rejected. And consistent with my new consumption of even cable news, I stayed nice and relaxed. And there they are this morning, reporting that while the Dems triumph everywhere, it's somehow bad for Biden. I heard that. Good grief. Hey, news media, do me a favor, will you? Go fuck yourself. Not you, Boomer. You the man. Keep rolling. Best garage door, Jeff. Yeah, there were some people who were saying, oh, this is bad for Biden. Kaylee McEnany, for example, she was saying that uh, we got to fight harder out there. Uh, but but the thing about, and so did Marjorie Taylor Greene, we got to fight harder out there. It doesn't matter how hard you fight if people don't agree with you and don't like you that's just the way it's going to fucking go but um McEnany was upset he goes well, i see all the democrats celebrating and doing all this stuff you better watch out biden's an albatross and he will drag you down my response to that is this joe biden endorsed a lot of candidates in that election across the country they all won Donald Trump endorsed a lot of candidates all across the country. They all lost. Just saying. Just saying, Kelly, I question what your thought process is here. All right. Next up. Hello, Boomer. This is Gordy from Utah. I've not written in a while. I've listened to your podcast since you've started. More than once in a while, you've kept me from wanting to go over the edge with diaper Donnie shit, literally. Here's my question. With little Donnie going to lose everything, including all his properties, could the Saudis swoop in and save his ass and companies? I was thinking they have already saved his ass in the past, especially the fact that they have sponsored their golf tournaments at his properties. They have gotten their bloody hands onto the PGA already. Could they legally purchase his Roach Motel and his properties? Thanks for your advice and honesty. On a personal note, I'm coming to Duluth for Christmas to visit my son and his family. If the weather is safe and we have time, maybe we could meet up for a burger. Thanks, Gordy. I'm always about a good burger, but I don't live in Duluth. I live in the cities. So, you know, I'm up for it. If, if it works out somehow, we can do that. Now, can the Saudis come in and buy all that stuff? Yeah, theoretically, they could, I would think. Um, I think business people in New York might have a problem with that and go into competition with the uh, auctioning off of these properties. Uh, but my question is, why would the Saudis do that? This is what I've said before. When it comes to Donald Trump, Russia was very interested in him. Saudis were very interested in him when there was something they could get from him, when he had some power or some influence. He doesn't have any of that anymore. Vladimir Putin isn't his buddy. Donald Trump was little more than a useful idiot. And when that useful idiot has no use anymore, I can't imagine that they're going to be there to help him out. I just don't think so. Even the Saudis. The Saudis are going to have some problems, too, uh, as Jared Kushner gets looked into about this $2 billion deal. I guess anybody could buy his shit, but if they buy the shit, they're not just going to hand it back to him. They're going to want something. And unfortunately, Donald Trump has nothing at this point. All right. 
Next one says, Hey, Mike, it's been a while. Hope you and your family are well. Recently, I've been seeing a few creators pushing voting against Biden due to his stance on Israel. <laughs> I cannot believe that these people are willing to put our country's future closer to the Republicans just because Joe isn't more adamantly opposing what Israel is doing. I do agree that the situation over Gaza is abhorrent, but why are they willing to sacrifice our future cause of things going over there? It's complete and utter nonsense. I'm listening to you and Maddie right now, and Maddie is bringing up writing, calling, etc., which is the correct thing to do. Everyone is correct in saying that the situation is terrible, but to make the White House more accessible to Trump or the Republicans is complete bullshit. I'm so disappointed in these leftist creators that are peddling this nonsense to put us at risk for more fascist behavior and laws limiting our rights is just crazy. I agree with you. I've told you before, taking for a big old dumb white guy like me, taking a position in the Israeli Hamas war is just fucking stupid. And it's easy for me not to take a position in it because I don't have a position in it. As I've said, I don't have a dog in the fight. Um, what these people are talking about, how Joe Biden is losing uh, votes because of this Israeli thing is, is absolutely ridiculous. And frankly, I don't believe it's true. Joe Biden has one option. Israel is an ally of ours. We have a responsibility as a country and he is a president to support the Israelis. That's just the way it is. Um, and what Joe's doing over there, he's not sending weapons and uh, giving them money to buy ammunition. He's trying to quell what's going on over there. He's trying to be a peacemaker. I mean, he's working on getting a three-day pause. He's working on getting uh, resources to uh, Palestinian citizens, the innocent folks. Um, if people are saying that, I don't think they understand what they're talking about. And I think the idea that that is some big groundswell of people voting against Joe Biden, that's ridiculous. That's not true. Take a look at the polls. Polls aren't true. Why would this be true? This is just another bullshit message that the Republicans are trying to put across. The Republicans will take any little thing to try to make Joe Biden look bad. They're looking at restarting, and we'll talk about this in a moment, uh, the investigation to impeach him, yet they have no evidence or witnesses. This is what the Republicans do. They're all about messaging. They're all about getting into the narrative. They don't care if it's lies or bullshit or exaggerated. They don't care. That's where it comes from. And that's important for us to remember. We don't listen to that shit. And uh, that email is signed by Joe. Warm regards, Joe. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. And uh, I think the idea that all these young people are uh, going to vote against Joe Biden because he supports Israel is absolute bullshit. I've talked to young people. I haven't heard one of them say that thing. That's just convenient for the Republicans to throw out there to try to shit on the Democrats. Sorry, motherfuckers. It's not going to work. All right, of course, Ivanka testified Wednesday that she had no role in her father's personal financial statements, echoing her adult brothers about documents central to the civil fraud trial. The former president's elder daughter, who has been in his inner circle in both business and politics, rounds out a major stretch in the trial. Her father took the stand on Monday. Her brothers, Eric and Donald Jr., testified last week, as we know. None of them did did any good for their case. Quite the opposite. Unlike her father and brothers, Ivanka is no longer a defendant in the New York Attorney General Letitia James lawsuit. It alleges that Donald Trump's asset values were fraudulently pumped up for years. Now, she said, I was not involved in his statement of financial condition, Ivanka said. Um. And she was pretty even-tempered and, and calm, unlike her brothers or, or her dad. She said she didn't recall ever having provided asset valuation information for the statements or having reviewed them 
before they were finalized. Now, before leaving the company to go with her father to the White House, Ivanka Trump was the point person in establishing a lending relationship with Deutsche Bank's private wealth management arm. This is where it gets interesting. And this is why they probably brought Ivanka Trump to the stand. Not so much of what she could say, but this allowed them to bring these documents into evidence. Basically, Donald Trump was trying to buy the Doral Golf Club in Florida. He went to a number of uh, banks and they said, fuck you. No, you don't qualify. It's not going to happen. And then Jared Kushner had a connection over Deutsche Bank in Europe. And uh, he sent Ivanka Trump to go negotiate with her. Now, initially, Deutsche Bank even said, yeah, now that's not going to work. But uh, they went back and retooled the uh, documentation of the values of his properties and how much his personal wealth was. And then all of a sudden, he qualified. Now, whether that was based on the lies that Jared Kushner and Donald Trump and Ivanka Trump came up with, or if it was a little bit of a push from the Russians, or it could have been both. Now, Ivanka Trump testified that her husband, Jared Kushner, introduced her to a banker as the Trumps were seeking to finance Durrell. The non-jury trial will decide allegations of conspiracy, insurance fraud, and all that stuff. But clearly, in that part of it, in those documentations, it perfectly illustrated how, um, how in fact, um, Donald Trump did lie. His family lied about his personal wealth and the value of his properties, and he got the loan. It's interesting about this. Donald Trump also had to guarantee it personally, but not only Donald Trump, his kids had to too. Don Jr., Eric, and Ivanka Trump, they had to put up property and guarantee a certain amount of money in order for him to get the loan. So Donnie was scraping. This so-called billionaire had to look to his kids to have enough money to qualify to buy one of his golf clubs. Here's an interesting story. Las Vegas real estate investor Robert Bigelow appears to be seriously reconsidering his support for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis as a Republican presidential contender. Speaking with the Financial Times, Bigelow described former President Donald Trump as more of a bull and DeSantis as a dinner. You better be able to kill, and that's not who Ron is, Bigelow said. Ron's in all kinds of trouble. Everybody's dropping out. The people who back him are pulling their money faster than you can imagine. Now, back in March, Bigelow dropped $20 million into the Never Back Down Super PAC, which supports DeSantis, making him the Florida governor's biggest donor. So far, however, he has not been impressed with DeSantis, who has been criticized for his past debate performance and ability to connect with voters. Trump is far and away the favorite candidate for the Republican voters, leaving DeSantis to fight for the number two spot. Uh, the polls alongside former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. Bigelow said that the October 7th uh, Hamas attack on Israel, civilians led him to conclude the U.S. needs a streetwise leader like Trump. Yeah. I've got to look at who would probably be the strongest commander with the most experience. And that's the only guy who would you want as a commander. I'd want somebody that would be a hell of an ass kicker if he needed to be. On the face of it, you lean toward Trump. Bigelow once boasted that he would give DeSantis more money and go without food. He has since voiced criticism of the Florida governor. So while this guy is bailing on uh, Ron DeSantis and he's supporting Donald Trump as a kick-ass good president, you have to question his decision-making. But nonetheless, uh, by the time... In the next six months, Ron DeSantis is going to be out of it. He doesn't have the support. People are pulling the money. He's not a viable candidate anymore. All right. Now, we got two wars. We've got a budget that we've got to come to some resolution on in, what, like eight days? Eight days. If they don't come to some resolution on the budget or at least a continuing resolution, the government will shut down. And this is not good news for the Republicans because they will take the heat for it. 
So what are the Republicans in the House doing right now? Trying to figure out the budget? Nope. Republicans want to talk to members of President Joe Biden's family as part of their inquiry whether to impeach the president. House Oversight Committee Chair James Comer on Wednesday announced subpoenas for the president's son, Hunter Biden, and brother James Biden, along with a family associate named Robert or Rob Walker. Now, the subpoenas are an escalation of the impeachment inquiry that so far examined thousands of pages of Biden family bank records, but failed to implicate the president in any wrongdoing. Now, a congressional subpoena is a legally enforceable request for information that lawmakers can ask a court to enforce. But Comer said that shouldn't be necessary in Hunter Biden's case. I would want to show up, wouldn't you, to defend yourself, Comer told reports, reporters. I've accused him of having shell companies and laundering money and evading taxes. That's like at least 10 years worth of prison time. I would want to show up and defend myself if I were innocent. The White House didn't say whether any of the subpoena targets would comply, but instead claimed Republicans have made investigating Biden's family a higher priority than virtually all other issues Americans care about. And let's be honest, why should the Bidens show up for these subpoenas? Jim Jordan didn't. All the, Kevin McCarthy didn't. All the Republicans didn't. They basically exposed uh, uh, congressional subpoenas as being absolutely fucking toothless. But more importantly, why are we making this a priority when we have really serious things to contend with, like the budget, like the Israeli-Hamas war, like the Ukraine war. But that's who the Republicans are. That's who they are. They are not serious. They aren't intelligent. They are inept, and their priorities are all fucked up. Now, despite, uh, this came from a White House spokesman, despite spending millions of taxpayer dollars to conduct this probe, they have turned up no evidence to support their outlandish allegations of bribery and high crimes and misdemeanors. Kind of smells of uh, the um, Hillary Clinton investigation. One of the main allegations Republicans have pursued is that vice, as Vice President Biden rigged foreign policy to benefit his son, ousting a Ukrainian prosecutor to protect a Ukrainian company that paid Hunter Biden millions. We've gone through this so many times. Yes, Biden did push to have this prosecutor fired, but it because he was corrupt. He wasn't prosecuting anybody, including Hunter Biden's company. He wasn't prosecuting anybody, and that's why they wanted him gone. But, of course, the Republicans can't grasp that. Now, in addition to the subpoenas, Comer is asking for transcribed interviews with Sarah Biden, the president's sister-in-law, Hallie Biden, widow of the president's late son, Bo Biden, Elizabeth Secundi, Hallie Biden's sister, Melissa Cohen Biden, Hunter Biden's wife, and Anthony Boblinski, a former business associate of Hunter Biden. Comer told HuffPost that he would ask Hunter Biden, what exactly did you do to receive millions and millions of dollars from these foreign nationals? Well, if we're going to do that, let's grab each one of the members of Congress and ask them how they got their money, how they got millions of dollars while only making $175,000. That, I don't know, that seems fair to me. Representative Jamie Raskin, the Oversight Committee's top Democrat, said Republican lawmakers had set a bad example by blowing off subpoenas from the House January 6th committee last year. But that didn't mean the Bidens should. Everybody's general obligation is to comply with lawful congressional subpoenas. And, you know, frankly, I don't know why they wouldn't. Why they wouldn't do that. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, when these folks get these subpoenas. But even when they get the subpoenas, the fact of the matter is, is that they, um, they aren't going to find anything. There is no evidence. There were no crimes committed. All right, we're getting down to the later stages here. You notice things kind of changed in the room here. I have two lights on either side of me. One of them went out. So we're going to have to fucking deal with it. 
Legal experts closely following defendant Donald Trump's myriad of criminal and civil trials are praising U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin's order on Wednesday requiring the ex-president to prove the basis for defense he has claimed he is expecting to use in the prosecution against him for allegedly attempting to overturn the 2020 election. Now, Judge Chutkin will require Trump to disclose by January 15th whether he intends to use advice of counsel defense in his Washington, D.C. trial and to provide relevant documentation of that defense at the same time. This is something we've been hearing about, and now it looks like it's a real deal. Trump is expected to allege he cannot be guilty of the crimes he is charged with because he acted on the good faith advice of his attorneys. He would have to have made full disclosure of all the material facts to his attorney before receiving the advice. Now, Judge Shutkin adds that if he does invoke that defense, Trump must waive attorney-client privilege and provide the court with all documents and evidence related to his claim. See, that's the catch-22. That's the trap. That's about the only defense he can throw out there, and there's enough evidence that proves that's not true. But if he decides to go with that defense, then the attorney-client privilege is off the table, which we know Donald Trump is not a big fan of. He wants to use anything he can to avoid telling any information he might have. Now, Attorney General, uh, Deputy, former uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General Harry Littman said, this is a very good development. Trump has to put up or shut up on this well in advance. Short point is that he doesn't have legal basis for asserting advice of counsel, and he'd have to waive privilege. So getting it out in the open early will preempt them from pulling fast ones. Joyce Vance, also a professor of law and former U.S. attorney, says Trump will have a heavy lift convincing the judge to permit him to use the advice of counsel defense at trial, among other things, because you can't rely on advice of your co-conspirators, even if they're lawyers. If the judge rules against him, it can't be mentioned in trial. That will take his defense away. And let's be honest, he doesn't have much of a defense. The evidence is pretty damning. And lastly, uh, right-wing podcaster Steve Bannon lashed out at the Republican National Committee on Wednesday after his party got their ass kicked on Tuesday. The Republican losses include an abortion referendum in Ohio, the Kentucky's governor's race, and the Virginia Senate. Bannon blamed the RNC for failing to convince Donald Trump supporters to vote. That's what he said. The reality here, Trump delivers MAGA, MAGA delivers victories. Really? 2020, they delivered a victory? 2022, they delivered a victory? I beg to differ. Bannon griped on his Wednesday War Room program. This was a turnout issue about MAGA, and the reason is the Ron DeSantis advisor, Jeff Rose of the world, and the billionaire donors, the billionaire donors with the hapless, feckless RNC, failed to get our people out. No, the fact of the matter is you just don't have enough motherfucking people. The MAGA only makes up, what, like 30% at most, and that ain't enough. Stand up and fight for redistrict, redistricting. Don't I want to hear the sob stories out of Virginia this morning? Don't come here this morning and start whining about abortion. Stand up and do your job. Get in the trenches and fight. You're a bunch of feckless, hapless, and this super PAC and Jeff Rowe delivers another crushing defeat, skimming 20%. Now, I don't even know what the hell he's talking. He's coming closer and closer to having to go to jail for a short time himself. So the faster we can get him out of the uh, equation, the better. But this was a standard opinion of Republicans. They're mad at Republicans for not fighting hard enough, for not doing the dirty tricks they're known for. But, but you know, the fact of the matter is, if you boil it down to logic and common sense, we have an issue, the abortion issue. 70% of this country minimum support a woman's bodily autonomy. They support Roe v. Wade. And 30% don't support it. 
So when you're a party and you decide to choose against 70 percent, you're going to lose elections, no matter how hard you fight, no matter what you say, no matter what dirty trick you want to pull, you can't win. And the faster you realize that, the faster you can change up what you're doing and maybe go a direction that might be beneficial for you. It won't be for five or 10 years, but uh, the Republican Party is completely destroyed. They wrap their arms around the wrong things, the things that most Americans don't like. And this is why they're not voting your way. It has nothing to do with not fighting hard enough or not having enough money. You're going to lose. You've been losing since 2018. And you're going to lose in 2024, no matter how hard you fight or no matter how hard you try to get a bigger turnout. There's only so many of you motherfuckers that will vote this way, and there ain't enough. There ain't enough. I've said this all along. There ain't enough of these motherfuckers to vote with you. So, sorry, you're going to be disappointed, but that's the way it is. All right, we are going to wrap up the Rational Boomer podcast. Hopefully, uh, you'll have a good day today. I appreciate you taking the time to listen, and of course, we will talk to you tomorrow.